Hello, fellow literati. Welcome to In the Dark, the internet's most laid-back literature show. Uh, in today's episode... Oh, I'm Nikita, by the way. Hello. <laughs> uh, in today's episode, I thought I could talk about originality um, and the role that uh, originality... the role that originality has in literature, uh, and kind of the, uh, the intersection of, uh, of influence and originality. Um, so we've kind of had a, a, couple of, a couple of episodes on influence now. Uh, if you haven't seen them, they are worth checking out. Um, very interesting topics. Um, and then so today, uh, I kind of wanted to see uh, if we could get to the bottom of whether, uh, you know, how original can you be? Can you really be that original? Uh, in the last episode, I kind of mentioned when I was talking about uh, Harold Bloom uh, and his uh, anxiety of influence concept, uh, I, I talked a little bit about how there's nothing, there's really no writing outside of influence. So... Um, you know, no matter how original you think you're being, no matter how original you think you're being, there's probably, uh, there's probably somebody that's done something like that. Um, and then e even if, uh, you know, if one thing is new, uh, other things will be not new. Um, so kind of the, the reason, here's how I would, uh, how I would explain this. Uh, so you can't, you can't be 100% new because then it won't, it wouldn't be poetry. Uh, it wouldn't be literature. It wouldn't be really like comprehensible, um, as that, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm sure there's people that have tried, um, Myself included, I'm I'm really into experimental uh, kind of writing. So, but I'm sure there's people that have tried to be like 100%, 100% original. But but really, like if you think about it, if you're using words, you're already pretty, <laughs> pretty unoriginal. I I forget who who said this, but uh, uh, somebody said that like uh, there is no originality because the words you're using have been used before, uh, most likely even in similar uh, order, which I think is an interesting concept. And kind of in relation to that, um, but but a slight side note. Um, there is a, a movement uh, in the 20th century called the Letterist International, I believe. Um, but they were kind of uh, interested in breaking down words into letters and things like that, if I remember correctly. I can maybe throw up on the screen uh, an example of, of that. Um, but you know, e so e even that, if you're like, if you don't even use words, um, you're still using letters. <laughs> um, anyway, so Kind of to return to the original point. Um, it's not that you can't be creative or, or do new things. It's just whenever you do something new, um, there's kind of a line between uh, being new and being like not <laughs> not comprehensible. Um, and and most people have kind of uh, an intuitive sense of where that line is. So you wouldn't really cross it um, just by accident, I think. Because um, then I think you would be able to tell that it doesn't really make sense. Um, and, and there's also a difference between, you know, somebody telling you that they don't understand and like the thing being incomprehensible, if that makes sense. Um, so if you create like a new poetic form, for example, 
and people are like, I don't get it. Or, you know, if, uh, for example, if you make some something of just like letters and people are like, oh, it's not poetry. Basically, uh, almost every movement, uh, every kind of innovation has been met with uh, criticism from the establishment of like, oh, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but you just got to be careful because it might it might actually not make any sense as well. Um, but it is true that like impressionism, the in painting, it got canned. Uh, I was just reading um, a book by uh, William Carlos Williams, and in the introduction, he's like basically responds to the haters like. And the haters are like, oh, this is not poetry because it doesn't use, <laughs> there's like a funny line in, in, in the first uh, section of the book where he's like uh, quoting like a supposed hater basically. And he's like, um, oh, you took away rhyme, which basically like, that's fine. <laughs> like we can tolerate you taking away, away rhyme, but you also don't use rhythm <laughs> in your poetry. So how the, how the heck are you calling it poetry, dude? It's not poetry. <laughs> it's lifeless. You suck, basically. It's like evil. <laughs> How dare you? Um, so yeah, it's like... It, it's kind of like a spectrum, I guess, where it's like you have... Like on the one side, you have just really... Well, okay, on the one side, you have literal plagiarism. Uh, and then... And just like... I don't think we'll have time to cover today. How much time? Oh, actually, maybe. Okay. Anyway, so you have plagiarism, which we'll come back to in a second. Then you have, like, really derivative work. Like, if you almost just, like, directly copy something. So it's, like, pretty derivative. Not really interesting at all. It's kind of like a ripoff. Then in the middle, you have, like, status quo of, like, like kind of expected, but just just fresh enough to like be passable and then you have kind of like you know slightly next to that you have like new pretty cool and then you have like avant-garde which is like really experimental usually or at least like one crazy like crazy concept and then you have just like uh, beyond avant-garde is just incomprehensible um, and, and uh, basically, um, if there was ground to cover in terms of, like, pushing towards the incomprehensible, I, I think to an extent that's kind of been the past hundred years or so in art. Um, I'm not 100% sure about literature, but in art, absolutely. Um, like with conceptual art and things like that. Um, but I think that's been kind of exhausted. Like, yeah, you could take a chair and say, My, this chair is a poem. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody has done stuff like that already. Um, and that's not something I think is like super interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like now there's, there's really, you can't be incomprehensible very well anymore. Uh, that's kind of been obliterated. So you just have um, kind of just avant-garde now. Um, the problem is that <laughs> uh, it's like that far extreme of being incomprehensible. Uh, I feel like now it's kind of, um, it's become, <laughs> become so commonplace that now um, that extreme has kind of like come full circle and become <laughs> And just derivative, or um, or status quo at least, which is a bit ironic, I guess. It's a little bit interesting. Um, but yeah, so you know, for most writers, you want to be somewhere between kind of new and and avant-garde, um, and and that um, zone, kind of the the shared some the shared uh, quality of it. Um, is that it, it does something new um, 
but it's still kind of like it, it's within it. You have to be like within a tradition to an extent. Which is why, um, you know, on the tamer side of things, like if you're just going to be kind of like new or clever, um, th there's a lot of writers like that where the, they'll take a sonnet and they'll do something cool or conceptual with it, or they'll take um, a traditional theme like spring or something, right? Like a, or take like a symbol and just, uh, Put that in some in some fresh perspective, um, or you know, for the avant-garde, um, a lot of the times what you'll see is if if they're destroying forms or, or they're doing something new with form, like the structure of a of a thing, um, the subject matter of it will be kind of more more classic. Um, or more relatable, and then vice versa. If the subject matter is like really random, um, a lot of the time the form. And again, this is not not always. Um, and another way that they kind of latch onto tradition, or or in another way in which they're um, part of tradition, I guess, um, would be uh, most of the avant-garde movements are kind of like in reaction to previous movements. Um, pretty much all of them are either directly influenced by other avant-garde movements or they're kind of the rejections of contemporary culture. I think that's true for probably every, every avant-garde movement, which is a pretty convenient way. Like, there's no avant-garde movement that's just, like, in relation to nothing, just... Because um, you can't really be, like... You can't really be avant-garde in relation to nothing, right? Avant part of the... The concept of avant-garde is that it's it's cutting edge in relation to the culture, right? So, you know, if you want to be like Dada, um, if you haven't seen the Dada video, you should check it out. Dada is very cool, uh, very helpful to know uh, what they are. Um, but if you're like Dada and you're just like, all right, I reject everything. Um, but like, yeah, technically, but good luck, to, good luck actually doing that. Um, they tried, they, they did a valiant effort. So they have, you know, anti-manifesto manifestos. Um, but you just can't, you can't be outside of it. You know, like a true, like if Dadaism could actually achieve, uh, or Dada, I actually don't like the term Dadaism, but if Dada could have achieved what they wanted to achieve, which is kind of like reject everything, then Dada couldn't have been a thing, but it's like inherently paradoxical um, because you can't um, you can't you can't exist outside of the thing that you're reacting to, um, and you can't really you know you can't write a manifesto about uh, like we're against manifestos because it wouldn't make any sense, right? It's like well, how are you against manifestos? Uh, if you're writing a manifesto, right? Um, so that was a bit of a tangent. Where, how do we get on this topic? <laughs> um, what's this episode even about? <laughs> um, I need Gracie to help me. I'm confused. Oh yeah, we were talking about uh, originality. So that's kind of that makes sense. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't, um, and, and I guess the, the reason why that even matters at all um, is just don't worry about, especially when you're studying out, don't really worry about being super, super original. Um, it just kind of as you learn more, like to, to be original, you have to understand what, what has been done before. Um, that's something that I've kind of learned recently. Um, it's pretty difficult to be original without knowing what there is. Um, because kind of how you be original is by looking at what there was 
and and giving that your own unique spin. Um, without knowing what there was, you'll you'll either like it either won't make any sense, or more likely you'll be uh, kind of on that like derivative end by accident and without even knowing. Um, and I don't want that to like sound depressing, <laughs> um, but it's just helpful to uh, take some time and and learn at least like the brief history of um, kind of you know like the the basic things you would learn in in like an an English course maybe in university. So just like the the general movements of um, of art history or or of uh, of literature. Um, which you can find uh, like summarized on Wikipedia, um, and that's kind of what I was also doing with the three-minute literature series, uh, which maybe I will continue in the future if there is renewed interest in it. They just take a long time to make, um, and it wasn't really uh, reaching a lot of people, so I thought maybe this would be kind of a more time-effective way, um, and also kind of a more engaging way. Uh, in a sense. Um, but yeah, so once you familiar, f familiarize yourself with um, the forms of the past, the subject matter of the past, um, even if you don't end up using a lot of that overtly, um, you'll at least know where, where your writing and your art fits. Um, but more likely than not, you'll find yourself uh, picking up influences um, as you discover writers that you enjoy. And even if what, what you do isn't, uh, isn't like a direct response to it, um, influence works in kind of neat ways. Um, just, you know, <laughs> uh, maybe like a turn of phrase will, will be inspired by a, a writer that you like or you know, it just helps to know. I, I guess that's kind of, <laughs> kind of an obvious uh, observation, but um, I just think it's fun, one way or the other. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and I wanted to say, so yeah, um, don't worry about <clears throat> being super original. Um, probably the best way to be original is by First of all, learning like what there was, and then after that, copying, like, not not just uh, being aware of it, but kind of understanding it on a technical level. Um, and and you don't have to necessarily be able to replicate it, uh, but it's like one thing to read uh, like a sonnet by Wordsworth, and it's another thing to be able to explain like the structural components, and at least being able to explain it. Like you don't have to spend three years writing sonnets uh, if you don't like them. But it's kind of like, I use drawing a lot because I feel like, um, maybe not nowadays, but before, uh, this is how, how artists were trained, where they would look at like masterworks and see the technique behind it. Um, and I think that's good to do for writers. That's kind of, that's how I approach writing, I think. Uh, and yeah, for the last thing, let's see, how much time do we have? Oh, all right, sorry guys, this one has been long. Uh, the thing that I wanted to mention was um, for the very like far end where it's literal plagiarism, uh, plagiarism is a style of, <laughs> of writing, kind of, with like, with uh, quotation marks. Um, so maybe the next video will <laughs> kind of have to be about that. Uh, but I'll get back to it. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, enjoy your day. Have a good day. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, this has been In the Dark. Uh, if you have a topic suggestion or any questions uh, about what I talked about today or things you just want to know about, if you've seen a, a word or you want to hear an opinion, uh, please leave a comment. Uh, below and I will cover it in another video. Uh, thank you for watching. Bye! <laughs>